Welcome to this amazing fourth video in our series for launching your new startup. I would uh, like to introduce Jen before uh, we get going. Uh, Jen is an amazing entrepreneur now and an executive that I've worked with for many, many years. She's uh, had uh, roles at Yahoo, head of groups and community at Facebook. She's been the president and CEO of Change.org. And now she's got a new role as the CEO and founder of Rising Team. And this is the second time that I get to work with Jen as uh, an investor of her company. Uh, welcome, Jen. How are you? Thanks for having me. Doing great. Thanks. So um, I wanted to uh, speak to you, Jen, because it seems like we're both uh, in a similar position. We, we've been sort of uh, in entrepreneurial roles in the past, um, and we've worked together in the past. And then you went on to do some amazing things, building some amazing teams and various a notable and, 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 and very successful companies in Silicon Valley. And now we both are in a situation where we're starting our own new firms. And my case is my new uh, venture firm, Roble Ventures. And in your case is Rising Team. And it sounds like uh, right at this very moment, uh, one of the biggest things that I'm considering is how to help my entrepreneurs build their founding teams from scratch. So you have written a great book, which I'd like to hear about, uh, called uh, Purposeful. Are you a manager or a movement starter? Uh, in fact, your book talks about uh, starting a movement and is very akin to starting your own startup, especially when you first attract your first 10, ten employees. You could draw experiences from your Yahoo, Facebook, change.org, but I also love, love to talk about how you're thinking about it right now in Rising Team and how I should think about it as I help my entrepreneurs uh, start their own companies, especially in the seed stage. Um, so let me start with this question. Um, in your book, Purposeful, you describe how many of the leadership traits necessary for starting a movement apply to the business world. Uh, what are the, uh, some of the most salient traits or social movement leaders that startup founders could learn from? Yeah, it's amazing, Sergio. When I, you know, I when I first got to change.org, I had come directly from Google after selling the deal map to Google, which is the company we, I was working on when we first met. And the thing that surprised me most was how similar the traits were between what I had seen in entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley and these people who were starting these amazing campaigns for social change. And I just thought People, more, if more people could hear about what's required to do this well, then way more of us could be doing it. And so I did end up writing a book about it, Purposeful. And there's, you know, there are many things that the book covers, but after doing a lot of talks about the book, I have essentially distilled it down to three key traits that I believe all good movement starters and good entrepreneurs have. I call them the three C's. Um, it's different from, we also have three C's in Rising Team, but they're different. So these three C's are courage, community, and commitment. And essentially, everybody who starts a movement or a company that becomes a movement, first they have courage. And I'm not talking about big C courage, like jumping out of a plane or you know, fighting in a war or things like that. I'm talking about the kind of courage it takes to get started with something when you don't know if it will work or if anyone else will support you. So I sometimes compare it to starting a standing ovation at a show that was just pretty good. You know, like you stand up and you're not sure anyone will join you, but you're willing to do it anyway. That's what great entrepreneurs have and great movement starters have because they're willing to just put themselves out there um, even if it doesn't work. So that's the first step. Second step is community, which is you don't have a movement or you don't really have a successful company unless you can persuade other people to join you. And this is the part you mentioned about the founding team. It's true also in social movements. Unless your vision is exciting enough that other people want to join you on it, and unless you know how to really effectively embrace those people and bring them in and give them a chance to really co-own your vision, you won't be successful. But if you can embrace that community and welcome them, you'll see a lot of success. And then the third piece, which I'm sure is pretty obvious, to, especially to founders you're working with, is commitment. Because every single thing we all do is bound to face obstacles. But it's especially true for entrepreneurs and movement starters that 
you know, I compare it sort of to like climbing a mountain, you know, some days feel sunny and you can see the top and everything looks awesome. And the next day, you know, your competitor launches some huge thing you weren't expecting and you feel like you're back at the bottom of the mountain again. And the people that really succeed here just have the commitment to keep going, like keep taking one step forward, one step up the mountain every day and to bring the people that are there with them along for that climb. That's great. No, I can relate to those three. Uh, and it sounds like you have been in uh, various situations where we had to uh, muster those three C's. So let me let me take you back to just starting when you start a company, a lot of our audience are either Stanford students uh, in my class or prospective entrepreneurs. Uh, so when you're looking for your co-founding team, what do you think most important are the most important qualities uh, that you're looking for? And uh, what are the qualities that you must possess uh, to aggrat- attract great people? Yeah, so if, starting with what you need, you know, founders really need clarity of vision and the ability to inspire other people around their vision. Because when you first start out and you're attracting a team, you're selling just an idea, right? And I always say really great visions have three parts. They have a purpose, which is the why behind your vision. They have an articulated future, which is what does the world look like if we're successful? And they have a story to go, like a personal story of why this matters. And so if I think about Rising Team as an example, when we think about, you know, the articulated future, for us, it is a world where everybody in the workforce feels deeply understood, supported, and able to reach their goals. And the why that matters is that we end up with a much more equitable world and more successful individuals and more successful companies if we achieve that. And when we think about the story that makes that come to life, it's interesting. One of the reasons that I chose the founding CTO that we that works with us at Rising Team is because he had a personal story that really related to our vision, right? He could say, I was kind of chugging along in my career and then I found this manager who believed in me and saw my potential and encouraged me to be a people manager. And that person altered the trajectory of his career. And so now he's super inspired about our mission because he says, what if I could turn every manager on earth into that person for their team? What if I could become that for more people on my team? And all of a sudden the personal stories become really contagious. So I think the first thing is about really having that clarity of vision and bringing people on board. In terms of what I look for, there's really two things. I mean, in general, I think people are most successful and companies are most successful when you have the combination of results orientation and values fit. And so I'm trying to find people who are equally as motivated about getting stuff done and driving results and feel like a fit with the values that we're creating for the company. So On the results side, what's important is to try to figure out where I'm strong and where are the things that I'm not as strong or the things I don't like as much and try to find people who balance me in terms of that. So I can do what I do best and other people can do what they do best and love to do. And on the value side, I think this just takes time. Like it takes time getting to know people and understanding that their values are a fit. So another good example, if I look at... um, Jeff, my my current founding CTO, you know, when I said to him one day, oh, there's a bunch of things that are like keeping me up at night. He said, why don't we make a worry list? You know, let's just make a list of all the things that are worrying, worrying us, worrying you. We'll share the worry list, right? Like that's someone who you want as a, you know, founding partner on your team because, you know, someone who's going to really believe in the mission, share your worries and help you get to where you're going. So along those lines, so what, what could go wrong in finding your co-founder or your co-founding team? And, and can you share some specific pitfalls that you've uh, ran into? From my perspective, the the thing that is the most challenging is if you don't spend enough time with the person up front that you really don't know what to expect. So a good example here, actually, when I started DealMap, 
which was previously named a different thing. The original founder there, um, who is just a great, great person, he and I probably didn't spend as much time as we probably could have before we decided to jump into this endeavor together. And so it just took us a little bit longer to find that working relationship. Like I, I remember up front, we had two really different ideas of how decisions should get made. You know, he had just come from Microsoft and you know, he would just say to me, why don't you just tell everybody what to do? You know, you're the CEO. <laughs> like he was used to the Steve Ballmer world and he could not understand why I wouldn't just like, you know, rule by dictatorship. Um, <laughs> and I would say, I'm not sure I have the right answer. Like until I talk to more people and gather more data, you know, that's how I make decisions is by collaborative nature of gathering that data. And it took a while for us to get over that hump. And in fact, there were days where we would just, we had a pretty small, very open space office and we would sometimes like go into the car or into the parking lot to like hash these things out so we weren't doing it in front of the team because you don't want, yeah, like the parents arguing in front of the kids. Um, but ultimately we really got to a place where we worked amazingly well together. And, you know, over time it blossomed into a great relationship. We're really good friends now. He's actually an investor in Rising Team. But I think spending a little bit more time up front would have been helpful. So for instance, in later um, opportunities where I was considering other things, we would literally sit down up front and say, let's talk about decisions. Who's going to make which decisions? How will we make them? Which ones would we make together before we ever started working together? That's great. No, that's a great, and he's a, a great investor in my fund it's as well. So we share investors now. Um, well, let me jump into a different question. Um, so all founders and leaders have their own theories on hiring, right? Um, so I'd like to know your personal look for early team members uh, and what's your unique experience been? Yeah. I mean, my philosophy on hiring in general is that, again, I always start with results plus values fit. So those are the two things I always look for because if you have one without the other, it doesn't work, right? You have someone who is all about results but treats people badly or doesn't live by the values of your company, they are toxic and, and really, really bad for organizations. But conversely, you may have someone who's the greatest person on earth and lives by all your values and just doesn't get done what they need to. And that's also really hard on organizations. So I try to, to have an interviewing process that really pulls out. First of all, we set a scorecard for what we're looking for on both skills and values attributes. And we make sure we're interviewing for all of those things. We usually do projects like very small projects as part of the interview process because my core belief is not everybody interviews well. Like interviewing itself is a skill and not everyone's an extrovert and you need sometimes people need more time to think. So we give them time to come back with something rather than having to come up with it on the spot. I really believe in um, what I call patterns of accomplishment, which do not have to do with the opportunities people have been offered. So for instance, I tend not to look for things like which fancy school did people go to or exactly which jobs they had before, but rather their energy for the role, whether they've been able to, despite whatever circumstances, you know, accomplish things in their lives. And I really believe people can also grow beyond functional boundaries. So I try to look for people who are just eager and smart and can contribute in a lot of ways. Um, the other thing I think is important is, you know, once you've been doing this a while, you get the chance to nurture relationships over a long time. So you, you know, I think you can build those relationships at one company and then often you can end up working with people again at other companies. So at Rising Team, we've hired some brand new people, but we've also hired, you know, people, someone I worked with at DealMap, people I've worked with at Facebook, people I worked with back in my Yahoo days keeping those relationships and those networks warm is important. That's great. Um, you know, one thing that uh, got me thinking uh, when I was uh, reading your book is, and which actually inspired me to, to uh, do my own uh, venture firm, uh, Roble Ventures, uh, is one thing that you mentioned in your book is how purpose is contagious. And to me, uh, now that I'm very thematically focused on the theme of 
hum, uh, investing in uh, human enabling uh, human enabling technologies, which obviously Rising Team is a great example of one that's really helping people get ahead. All people get ahead and with a very good mindset around equity and inclusion. Um, so one of the things that I was uh, wanted to hear more about is um, how do you how do you think about purpose and uh, what should you be thinking as you recruit your team as it relates to purpose and the obstacles that may create or the opportunities that it may create? Yeah. So for years, I've been doing this assessment with my teams that I call the motivators exercise. It's actually now been productized as part of Rising Team to understand what people really care about at work. And I've learned two things. One is that people are really unique. There's lots of different things that motivate people. And unless you ask them, you don't know what they are. But the other is that there are some really key similarities between people. So in almost every chart, there are three things that come up for people. And the first one is purpose. So there's, in this case, it's, it's purpose. The second one is people, liking the people I work with and so forth. And the third one is path, which is having growth opportunities and so forth. But purpose is critically important to people and especially more so lately, and especially with people who are in younger generations, like they will take purpose over money in many cases. Um, so it's really important to be able to clearly articulate not only the, the reason why you're doing things, but the people who will be positively impacted or the you know, parts of the planet that will be positively impacted, et cetera, by what you're doing, because it will help inspire people a lot more about their jobs. Um, as I said, like for us, people can find their own individual stories or the stories they wish they had in their career is part of the reason why, you know, when we put our first job listings out, we got more than 300 applicants in the first two weeks for the jobs that we listed. It's just our, the mission was so interesting to people um, that we didn't actually have to work that hard to find great people. I'd say there's, there's three tips that I have for people about this, though. One is storytelling, but also data. So it's helpful to tell the story to inspire. But for me, for instance, I could say, when you look at the data, you know, 70% of the variance in employee engagement can be explained by the quality of managers. And 90% of managers say they're ill-equipped for their roles. And so you have data to back up the, the fancy story. The second is that as soon as you get any kind of early wins or customer feedback, you can start using those as part of persuading people. So, you know, testimonials from your first customers or any data about your early traction, that also helps, you know, woo both team and investors. And then the third thing I'd say is transparency is also important because, you know, startups are not perfect. They go up and down. And as we talked about, there are often obstacles. And so it's really important to be honest with your team or your prospective team about that. Because if you're not, you often end up attracting the wrong kind of people. At these early stage companies, you need people who are willing to roll with the punches and fall off the horse and get back on again. And if you make the story seem too amazing, then sometimes you find people who aren't willing to take the ups and downs of a startup. So I, you know, for instance, I always talk to my team about the fact that it may take several tries to find the perfect product market fit. And I give them other examples from my past where things took a while. And I think that helps them know what they're preparing for. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that I keep thinking about in my firm and the founders that I'm looking to fund, like yourself, is, uh, is the purpose of enabling humans through technology. Um, but one question that comes up is, once I do fund those uh, early founder CEOs like you, how do they sort of get the early team inspired and engaged and keep them inspired and engaged? I assume that the mantra of the company and the purpose of the company is one thing, but there's got to be uh, examples of how you continue to inspire them and engage them. Uh, can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, we talked about purpose a little bit before and how that's a major motivator, but also data and transparency. I think the other thing I'd add here is that what I've seen from communities and, you know, I spent a couple of years running the groups team at Facebook. So I've spent a lot of time in kind of scaled communities and how they work. And the thing I've seen most is that communities are most successful when people feel involved and when they feel ownership. 
So the thing that works best in these large communities as they're scaling is finding the people who early on are pretty involved and giving them more and more responsibility. And the same can be true of your team, your early team. So when you're hiring people, you know, the nice thing about a startup is that you have the ability for people to take on more if they want to. So as an example, there's someone I hired originally part-time to do kind of data analysis work for us, you know, ex McKinsey consultant, really good at data. Um, interestingly, when he came in, one of the first things he did was take the talents exercise, which is another assessment we give on rising team to kind of identify the things that you really love to do and that come easily to you. And it turns out that analyze, which is the job I'd hired him for, was one of the lower things on his list. It doesn't mean he's bad at it. He's actually quite good at it, but he just doesn't enjoy it that much. And so it turns out, you know, he was much more interested in things that helped us put processes in place or help the team feel connected. And he actually came back and said, I'd like to propose a role where I, I'll keep doing the, you know, the work you hired me for, but I'd also like to take on you know, employee onboarding for us and you know, how can we make an amazing policies and handbook and all these things that we also needed to do that I didn't have anyone to do. And the great thing about that is as a small company, I have the ability to say yes to him. Right. And that keeps him more engaged and more excited because I can leverage his talents and also get done the things that the organization needs. So, you know, I think of it like a Venn diagram. There's actually a a concept for this in, in Japan called Ikigai, where you overlap things I love to do, things I'm good at. And in my case, things the organization needs. That's where you're trying to find people in their sweet spot. Um, so. Great. So in that example, so let, let me press on that a little bit. Uh, in that example, you're very flexible and you have the flexibility being a small company. Uh, but at the end of the day, not every hire is going to work out. So, uh, you know, and when you're tight on resources, you, you have to make some tough calls as well. Right. Um, so one thing that it'd be useful to, to know is how do you make those calls and, and, and what do you think about uh, when having to let go of of the a person that may not necessarily be a fit do you spend time coaching him how much time how much time do you uh, adjust the role like you described uh, so you know can you describe that a little bit more and what's your philosophy there yeah. yeah absolutely and this is this is so so important and obviously the first thing to try to do is hire well right like try to vet these things out and try to spend more time up front and in fact It is why I start a lot of people on a project basis if I can. Like if people are not intent on a full-time job right away, and especially I think we were lucky a little bit during the pandemic that people wanted things that were more flexible, we started some people on a part-time role. So we could each see if it turned out to be the right fit. And when it did, then we can say, great, we'd love you to come on board and take a role more like this. And if not, then it's much more comfortable to part ways because you've hired them only as a contract person, you know, for say a project or two. Um, But let's assume that you have hired the person and you decide that they're not performing in the role that you want. The first thing I do is gut check that expectations are clear. Because often it turns out that this is the fault of the manager, not the team member. Because if you don't lay out crystal clear expectations for what you want and get their sign off that they completely understand those expectations, then it may be that you just weren't clear and, you know, they're doing what they think you asked for. And so the first thing to do is just double check 100% that you've been clear about what you want. Then if you are 100% clear and they still can't deliver on what you're asking for, then the question is, is it a skill issue or a talent issue? Like sometimes people, um, as I said, they could be good at something, but they just don't really like it, which might mean that they're just in the wrong role. And we've seen this example with some of the people who are using Rising Team you know, for instance, I have a woman who's, who runs a customer care group and she had someone in her team that was just really struggling. And we looked at his talents exercise and his top two talents were analyze and adapt. But his job is to answer customer care tickets all day. So, you know, he was like deer in the headlights. You know, he 
just wanted to reanalyze and rethink everything when instead he needed to be, you know, knocking out these tickets. And so she actually ended up coaching him into a different role where instead he analyzed all the tickets for patterns and passed them to product and so forth. As you say, that can't always happen because sometimes you don't have that role available. And in that case, though, you're still uncovering the same thing with the person that they're not in the right role. And so in that case, letting them go becomes a little bit easier because you can say, let's look at the places you do have talents and let's talk about the kind of roles those would look like. We don't have one here now. We might later, but let me help you find something like that somewhere else. Let me be a reference for you, et cetera, to help the person find something that's a better fit. Um, And then the last thing I'll share here, it's actually a model we use. So I, I teach another class at the business school and we use a model in that class about whether you should coach someone or let someone go. I call it Corvette. Um, It has, it starts with four letters, C-O-R-V. The et isn't really in it, but I just added that. Um, (laughs) Sounds good. Yeah, it's like, I try to make mnemonics so that I can remember them. But the idea is if someone's, you know, done something wrong, for instance, or just done a really bad job, the first thing you want to do is say, is their contrition. Like, do they realize they did something wrong or did a bad job? Is is there an understanding of it? And are they sorry? They want to do better. The second, the O is for ownership. So do they take ownership and say, yes, here are some ideas for how I could do this better, et cetera. The R is repetition. So is this something that just happened once and then never happened again? Or do you see it multiple times over and over again? And the V is for values fit. So again, like maybe they can correct the, the problem, but they aren't behaving in a way that feels like it fits the values of your organization. And if you see issues on any of the Corvette elements, then generally it's a sign that you should let the person go rather than continue to try to coach them. And the mistake most of us make is waiting too long to let someone go. No, that makes sense. Let me ask you the uh, the notion of uh, A players versus B players, right? Uh, people say, well, I only want A players. One of the things that I talk in my class about is the the chemistry of teams and the fact that if you have superstars, and I, mean, I think I, we've referenced the Lakers team where they had all superstars, five superstars, and they, they never won, right? Uh, so the, the chemistry wasn't there, uh, but the, each of them were A players, so one question for you is, can, can the coach, in, in, in your case, the CEO and the organization, the purpose, the motivation, can they turn B players into A players? And how do you think about the chemistry notion when, when, when my founders are sort of obsessed about sort of the individuals rather than the team chemistry? So can you yeah. explain that a little bit more? Um, It depends, but generally it's pretty hard to do that. Like what I find is that there are people who just innately are A players and have been their whole lives. And this is why, you know, my favorite interview question is, tell me how you got to be the person I see on your resume. Like, what were you like growing up? And, you know, people who are A players will tell you story after story about things they did where they achieved something as a child, even if they had total lack of opportunity, right? It might be helping their family in some way or something else. Um, And it's hard to get that intrinsic motivation. Um, It's hard to teach that. So I think in general, I try to look for it more than, um, more than grow it. I do think you can grow people in, in lots of ways um, and you can help people learn new things and get better in their careers and so forth. But this particular thing is a little bit hard to teach. Um, what I would say is that uh, to your point, well, one thing is it's, it is risky to have too many B players inside organizations because the A players get very demotivated by seeing people on their team who are just not putting in as much effort or don't want you know, to see the team succeed and so forth. And they also, the thing about B players is that they tend to try to hire people who are less good than themselves because they don't want to be shown up by someone else. Whereas A players usually try to hire people better than themselves because they know they can learn from someone and they'll lift the whole team up. So 
if you have too many B players, you end up with this like sea of B players as the organization grows and they hire other people who are also not as strong. Um, that said, I think you can run a company effectively with a blend here. And what really matters is putting people into the roles that suit the things that really come naturally to them. Because some people might be a B player at something and an A player when they're really doing the thing they love. And that's why we use the talents exercise to kind of figure out what roles are, are the best ones for people. And the last thing is, as you point out, a lot of it does come from connection with the team. Like people tend to perform better when, they're, when they want to make their team happy. When they're a member of a team and we all succeed or fail together, I don't want to let you down. And so that's why so much of what we've built in Rising Team is about the connection and the, the deeper understanding of people um, because generally everybody performs better when they want to be part of a winning team. Great. So Jen, since you've been working with a lot with venture investors and have a venture, have been in venture boards yourself, uh, I would, as I start my firm, uh, the number one thing I think about is how I can create an environment, both in the executive team, the founding team, and the board that fosters uh, creativity. And one of the things that I've noticed is that when you bring different types of people into a room with true diversity, true equity, best ideas flow to the top, uh, then you get better results. The worst thing that could happen in a venture uh, environment, especially in a, in a founding environment too, is, is that you, you, you would generate groupthink uh, because everybody else is finishing up, finishing each other's sentences because they've come from the same place, same ideas. How do you think about this notion of diversity in early stage startups and just diversity of thought and diversity of backgrounds? And how do you incorporate it in team building? Yeah, this is so extremely critical. And I, I just could not agree with you more here. The data is very clear that more diverse teams perform better on almost every statistic. As you say, they're more creative, they're more innovative, but also you know, the numbers, even if you look at larger companies or board diversity, generally outperform. So we've taken this really seriously. It's also much easier to do when you're a small company to just start from scratch saying this is important to us. You know, our team is 60% women, we're 50% BIPOC, like it's been critical to us from the beginning. And part of the reason is not only do we believe we'll be better as a company, but we believe it's so critical to represent the people we're building for. And if you don't have different voices in the room, oftentimes you miss things. And here, I'm going to give you two very small examples. So we built a tool in Rising Team, we call it Magic Hat. And it's like a Slack bot that is a team building bot. It basically pulls a fun team building question out of a hat, a magic hat, at the frequency of your choosing. So maybe once a day or once a week, you know, some fun question goes out to your team. We've been using it with our team, you know, to test it before we launched it with everybody. And it turns out that some of the questions in the question bank, you know, may have some underlying bias that we weren't aware of until the question comes out to a diverse group of people. So two examples that came up, one was, you know, I realized it because I'm much older than everyone on the team. We, the question was, how old were you when you got your first phone and what phone was it? And all of a sudden I realized like I was out of business school by the time I got my first phone and almost everybody else on our team is like, oh, seventh grade or whatever. Um, and all of a sudden I realized it was this like very ageist kind of question that we yeah. had in there that you wouldn't have noticed, but could easily make someone feel uncomfortable. Um, and then the other example that came up, there was a, a seemingly pretty simple question that said, what was your favorite teacher? Who was your favorite teacher in school and why? And one of the women on our team grew up in Nigeria and went to like a very strict, almost military school. And she just described this really difficult situation growing up in her school and how everybody was punished all the time and there, there weren't any, you know, favorite teachers. And it was sort of, you know, those moments just make you realize that people's experiences are truly different. And if you aren't running your product through some kind of filter where you have different backgrounds and experiences, you're likely to miss things that make it, might make it worse and miss opportunities to make it much better. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I in my class, I came up with the iPod, how the iPod became the prototype to the iPhone. And I mentioned that this all started with a Sony Walkman. So, uh, you know, that was, that was, that was a blast from the past. Thankfully, it was, a, it was a device featured in Guardians of the Galaxy. So that was right. Nice. That's right. Great. Anyway, Jen, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. This is awesome. And uh, I'm so excited about Rising Team and, and both of us being entrepreneurs again. It's awesome I know. to do that. It is. I'm excited for Roblay Ventures too. So thank you again, Jen. And uh, we'll talk soon. Good luck with everything. Thanks, Sergio. You too.